Okay, test. Of the things we say, think, say, and do, is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it build goodwill and better friendships? Will it be beneficial to all concerned? All right. Awesome. Now, we're going to keep packing people in here for the next few minutes. We have a weird schedule. So, when the senator shows up, everybody who's a sunriser, I need you to just come straight up here. We're going to pack into this area. We're going to put the senator right here. And we're going to take a photo. So, Kevin is right in the front. He's in the red, the red spot. So, that's how we're going to do it. But then, as soon as we get that, we all need to get back to our seats quick because he's got a 15 minute presentation. Five minutes. Then we have 10 minutes. We're going to try to get in the community service room. So, we're going to let Run up there. statue replacement? We're going to try to switch. Don't start with me. <laughs> we're going to switch. We're going to try to drop this down so we can have the screen. We're going to make it work. It's going to be great. So, in the meantime, we're going to go through and guests. And guests. We'll do Rotarians in We can do Rotarians now. Let's do Rotarians now, too. Yeah, Patrick O'Rourke. I'm from the Arcana Name Club. All right. Patrick. Uh, you know who I am, but I brought uh, Cody Ruggett, uh, who's the director of aviation for the County of Humboldt. Right. All right. Here. I have the history students from Arcata High who are going to go to state. Um, we have Jocelyn, Kevin, and Michaela McDonald, and parents. So why don't you stand up with your hands? This is Wes, Wim, Flip, and Beth Eschenbach, and Heidi McDonald. Awesome! And it's very exciting because we get to do a check presentation for them. Yes, Mr. Terry. This is my friend Ann Lam uh, from e Bookkeeping. Good today. Good morning, Molly Smith, Arcadian New President. Are you here just to visit or do you need your gavel back? I want my gavel, I want my badge, and my pajamas. Wow. Well, I'm in the past may have stolen Arcata Noon's gavel, and I may have continued with that tradition. We'll just move on. <laughs> Did we ever get Patrick? Yeah. Okay, cool. Thanks. Patrick is here and again. Perfect. Kevin Cooper from Snag River Union. And I have a friend, Amanda Nelson, visiting us again, not the other Amanda Nelson, the real Amanda Nelson. All right. Come on over here, Lisa. There's a spot for you. Oh, come on. I'd love to try to get you to the front. No? <laughs> then don't talk today. Do we have any other guests? We don't get any uh, There's a spot right here. Right there. Perfect. Oh, my life. Right there. Right. There's, there's a spot right there. It's made for your rear. Anyway. So I love that everything always goes this way. I was told specifically Finn wouldn't be here, and he's right there. Yay! All right. Backpacks. Yes. Who is delivering today? We have we have yeah. delivered. So a lot of people are going to go from here to be setting up for the event. So we still have a few people to show hands to fill backpacks. All right. Perfect. Thank you. And check the sign up, Genius. Um, I sent it to the April to June group, but I'll send it to everybody. Because we're dark the next two weeks, we have some things. But check it out, sign up. It'll tell you what, who to be and where to go. A note about that, we are dark next week for the spring fundraiser, which is not the spring fundraiser, it's the Taste of Spring, but the following week we're not really dark because 
AJ is doing his firesides. So make sure that you show up for those. All right. Announcements. Do we have any specific announcements? Um, can I just say before the senator gets here, I put a little flyer for the trail summit that is tomorrow. They'll be speaking about it. But it contains not only the senator's town hall, which he'll be talking about, but also at 9.30, there's a local trail showcase up at the Cape Buchanan Room. And so I hope those of you who are coming to the event come for not just the senator's town hall, but the whole thing, which um, starts at 9.30 tomorrow morning. So I know there's a lot going on this week. Yes. <laughs> Uh, you received an email from uh, Howard asking for a video case, just to let you know that we got one. Randy came through for it. Handcuffs in the briefcase. So we'll do it. Yeah. Uh, wait, did Randy come through with the handcuffs? Did no, you wear those in this morning. You know, I got the handcuffs. You don't tell the story again. <laughs> you don't want to know Great where story. I got it. Scott, 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 Scott I just. I, 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 Scott, I just want to know how long it took you to get the fur off those handcuffs. <laughs> Maybe it comes off right, it just slides right off. Nair works amazingly on handcuffs. Uh, even then, other announcements? Other announcements? All right. Taste of spring. Is there anything additional needed? If you haven't sold your tickets yet, just buy them and give them out. <laughs> today is the day, so I mean, unless you're going to sell the rest of them today, which I encourage you to do, uh, go for it. You know. Other than that, there's still a couple places on the sign of genius if you still haven't signed up. We're pretty much full. There's just a couple spots near the end of the night. But other, and we always take more. And we always They do become collectors' items shortly after the end of the event. <laughs> well, and actually, I do have one thing. We're picking up Kenny's chocolates today because um, he's going to be a vendor, but he can't serve it. So if somebody would like to be one of the servers for the chocolate, it's not on the sign of genius because we didn't know he's coming until yesterday. So when we get there, you know, go for it. Start thinking about it. And if anybody has money for tickets, event tickets, and or raffle, or their 25 dollar cash, just go to Dustin or myself so that we can track it. How's the wine? Are you good on wine for a delicious biscuit? All right. We tested every bottle. If you didn't bring a bottle of wine, we need every bottle. So. Do you want people to bring extra for Dustin? Dustin, would we like extra wine to be brought? Do you need people to bring a second bottle? Um, well, if you can, yes. We'll know, yes. Our, we'll know what our exact count is though in a little bit, but if you can, yes, please do. Yes. So ex if someone has extra wine, I don't know what extra wine looks like, but if you have extra wine, please feel free to bring it. All right. So, timing-wise, I look at my clock, and the way this should work is you should walk in right now, but things don't work like that, so we're going to go out of order. So, actually, Jeff, this will be perfect timing. Why don't you come on up real quick? Don't start talking until you get there. Everybody's got to be there. Please, front, front and center, we want you. You're the highlighted piece here. Front and center. So every year our club sends at least two students to um, sponsors them to go to State History Day competition. This year we have Michaela McDonald and Jocelyn Blimmon. And so why don't you just tell everybody kind of what your topics are and what you did. Um, history day. Uh, mine was James Rosenquist, his questions and his art, and he was a 1960s pop artist, and I uh, looked at the influences he had over the culture and what he was trying to say with his paintings. Um, what color? What color was it? African American female band leader of an all male band during the Harlem Renaissance, wow. and she kind of a lot of popularity because of Jim Crow segregation, and so I kind of looked at how that um, correlates to things happening today. So the HCOE, um, basically, the, the coaching sessions, um, they gave these two um, a big round of applause for the hard work and everything that they did, so yeah. that's, I just want to say good job. 
So it's probably not there. She didn't bring her back up. I didn't bring my back up. You didn't bring your back up, I didn't get it. Shadow puppets. those but Terry took a trip and she's going to tell us all about it. They're apparently on this screen. So you'll all receive the pictures because I have them. I just can't put them up right now. My father was in the Navy for 34 years and from the time I was six and a half till almost nine we lived in Japan. And it was a great place to be a little um, child because the Japanese love children no matter whose they are. And uh, my mother had both my brothers in those two and a half years, so she was mostly just pregnant and, and kind of distracted. And I was lucky enough to be in elementary school. And one of the great things about it was that there was a lot of competition for teachers to go overseas and teach in military um, dependent schools. So we had fabulous teachers, and every Wednesday we had Japanese Culture Day, and they either brought in people to talk to us about it or took us on field trips. And then I was there again 15 years ago for the Rotary Convention in Osaka. And I never really thought about going there again. I'm blaming John Richmond for this one again. Thanking him. Because we were having lunch about a year and a half ago, and I was telling him this story. And he said, well, when are you going again? And I said, not. And so anyway, I planned a trip to Japan. Marty had never been there. And we went last month for two weeks, and it was fabulous. It was um, everything I remembered and more, and we were lucky enough, the timing was perfect. We saw cherry blossoms, which you know, don't have a big window of time. The country, if you read the Time Standard, Tracy Barnes Priestley was also there last month, and she wrote two great columns about the Japanese culture. There's no litter, um, there's no graffiti, there's no vandalism. It uh, is amazing, and I realized when I saw Mount Fuji the third day that we were there, that I had left part of my heart in Japan when I was a little girl, and so I got to be with my the rest of my heart again, and Marty had a wonderful time, and we're going to go back. <laughs> Now this is the moment where we get the Sunrisers to snap into action and run up to front. Watch out for the camera. This is a lot of 
We start out with the economy, you talk about um, issues uh, surrounding education, we'd like to talk a little bit about uh, road infrastructure, uh, health care, etc. Is that okay? Yeah. All right, let's get this party started. So, uh, long story short, uh, we live in one of the largest Senate districts in the entire state of California. Each Senate district has about a million folks, so we stretch from the Golden Gate Bridge all the way out the Oregon border, uh, and then we also take in Trinity County as well as in Lake County, so seven counties uh, all throughout. We're known for many great things, as you all know. We have more craft breweries in our district than anywhere else in the West Coast. We have more wineries than anywhere else in the United States of America right here in our district. And ladies and gentlemen, we grow 60% of the marijuana in America. Hey, hi, Dave, watch out. Um, so, hey, you know, it's a very happy district. Uh, all of a sudden, it got very awkward for the judge. So, uh, <laughs> uh, look, uh, bottom line is this. While California does have challenges, uh, we are number one in job growth in the United States of America three straight years in a row. Uh, we are seeing record unemployment, whether you're in rural California or downtown Los Angeles. Record unemployment throughout the state, uh, which is fantastic. We're now the fifth largest economy in the world. While we're just 12% of the United States population, we create 17% of the jobs. 25% uh, of America's gross domestic product is coming from the Golden State. Uh, and absolutely, um, and, uh, and while we are focused, obviously, on a strong economy, 
We're also focusing on our environment. We have the strongest clean air and clean water rules uh, in the United States of America. And we've cut our greenhouse gas emissions from peak 2004 by 13%, leading the nation uh, in reducing our carbon footprint. So while we are growing jobs, we're also cutting our carbon footprint, uh, and we're also saving. So right now, times are really good. We had a $4 billion swing in the month of April meaning that we were about a billion dollars less than where we thought we'd be with our budget as far as our surplus. That changed. As people started paying their taxes, we took in three billion, closed the gap, and now we're a billion ahead. We're going to finish the, the fiscal year about five billion in surplus here in the state of California. So what the heck are we doing about it? And what are we doing with it, most important, right? Number one, we're saving for the bad times. Uh, and I got to tell you, the state has not always done the greatest job of putting money away when times were good, like we all do, right? Uh, so we are at $14.5 billion in our rainy day fund. We'll hit $20 billion in the next three years. We have the highest rainy day fund out of any state in the United States of America, uh, which is uh, critical. Um, we uh, also are leading uh, when it comes to the issue of investing back in our economy. So we are also now starting to invest in, in small businesses, 25 employees or less, providing tax credits uh, for those who are starting to hire as well. Again, we give so much to large corporations, we got to start focusing on the heart of our economy, and those are small businesses, 25 employees or less. Just a quick statistic, we're going to move on from the economy. If the Bay Area, the San Francisco Bay Area, the nine counties were its own uh, world economy, it would be 19th largest in the world. So again, things are going well, but it's not going to last. So we got to be able to save. In our rainy day fund, we got to pay down debt. We spent about ten billion dollars paying down pension debt over the last twenty-four months. We're paying down bond debt as well, which is critical. So save, pay off debt, and we got to invest what makes this state strong. And we got to invest in strong public schools. Uh, and we're going to have record funding, record funding in our in our public education system this year. It's never been higher. And we have to make college more affordable and accessible, and we have to focus on career training in our high schools. So what the heck are we doing with that? So we made a promise two years ago. Two years ago, the state of California said that if you were going to be a student going, a high school student, going to community college, you'd be able to have your first two years of community college paid for by the state of California. We're going to follow through with that promise this year. This year, we're going to invest the final $40 million where if you are a full-time, a full-time community college student, and you're going to the College of the Redwoods, and you're making grades, the state of California will pick up your first two years of community college for free. Uh, to be honest, a lot of folks say we got to make free, we got to make CSU. If you see free, I totally agree, and I'm just being honest, we simply can't afford that at this time. 60%, 60% of CSU grads, 60% of UC grads are coming through our community college system. I went through a community college system. It took me three damn years to get out because I couldn't pass statistics. And, uh, <laughs> but it finally happened. And uh, I was so happy. Uh, but what I'll say is this. Look, we have to make college more affordable and accessible. And we also come to grips that 72% of public high school graduates, 72% in this state, will not go on to a four-year college degree. Uh, and we have to make sure that we have robust career training programs in our high schools. So we have secured $300 million in permanent funding for career training and job skill classes in every high school across the state. And we're also <coughs> investing in ag science. Uh, that was really important. Uh, in, I was in FFA growing up. Uh, so we've also saved every FFA program in the state with this money, uh, and we're expanding ag science courses across the state, being the number one agricultural state in the union, which is also critical. Uh, and what you're also going to see is an investment in housing. We have an affordable housing crisis in California. We are short 1.5 million, 1.5 million affordable units between 2015 and 2025. Uh, so the state is going to invest $12 billion over the next five years in workforce affordable housing in three categories. Very low income, which is the hardest to house. Low income, uh, as well as moderate uh, income affordable homes. So you're going to see more of that. I'm going to just keep going uh, and just do a little quick uh, lightning round. Can we talk about health care for a moment? Yeah. All right. 
So I don't know if you noticed, but there's a little bit of awkwardness between the state and Washington, D.C. <laughs> and we're not going to get political here today, but it's vice versa as well. Okay, so it's all good. But uh, I just want to talk about statistics and not talk about politics. The Affordable Care Act. So the Affordable Care Act is not a perfect system. Do we need to improve it? You're damn right we do. And uh, here's the problem. We have uh, folks who want to be able to completely gut it and get rid of it. The state of California, the state of California utilizes the Affordable Care Act to cover California or any other state in this nation. Rural California are the highest utilizers of the Affordable Care Act. Humboldt, Delmore, Trinity, Lake, Mendocino. We are some of the highest utilizers of the covered California system. So what will happen is this. Millions, millions of Californians will be without health care insurance. Since the Affordable Care Act passed in 2013, in 2013 our state was at 17% uninsured. Highest it's ever been. Fast forward to last year, we are now at 7%. 7% uninsured. The lowest, the lowest it's ever been in our state's history. So where I feel frustrated is that we are taking a look at significant generational change by providing health insurance to Californians and to some of the most vulnerable populations in our state. We're talking about ripping up the rug, and it's simply not acceptable. So we are already going to put in about a billion dollars to backfill uh, some of the cuts from the feds this year, uh, and we are now in the midst of a lawsuit to be able to keep the Affordable Care Act intact. More to come on that, but that is a significant liability for this state. The other significant liability that we're having right now, fire. Wow. <coughs> and as many of you have seen, especially in Northern California, it's impacted us tremendously. And what I will say, and I will get a little emotional and I apologize, uh, but uh, you never know what you're going to face when you start a new job. And it was 2015, and I, uh, I volunteered my time to be able to do uh, auctions for nonprofits. And I was down in Marin County doing an auction for a, um, for a foster youth agency. <coughs> And my phone was just going off. Uh, and I couldn't answer it. And it was the sheriff from Lake County. And I finally was able to call back. And he had a few choice words saying, you need to hightail it up to Lake County. Because Middletown was on fire. Uh, got up there a little after midnight, met him in Lakeport, we then drove over. And I will tell you, I've never seen anything like it. And I will be honest, I never thought I'd see anything like it again. The entire community was on fire. You drive into the firehouse. And every home around that firehouse was on fire. That, uh, that fire moved with such speed and violence. Coming down that hill, uh, within 24 hours, 1,282 homes were destroyed. I'm going to fast forward. That was in 2015 to 2016. We had the Clayton Fire, another 300 homes destroyed. And we had multiple wildland fires in Lake County. Since 2015, I might add, Lake County has lost 69% of their total land to wildland fire. 69%. Fast forward to 2017. I was standing on the Hopper Avenue overpass the night after the North Bay firestorm, where Kmart used to be in Santa Rosa. And I was watching the Hilton burn down. Uh, almost 6,000 homes destroyed. 6,000 between Sonoma, Napa, Lake, and Mendocino from that fire. Fast forward to 2018, almost 19,000 homes destroyed in paradise. The worst fires that we've seen, 14 of the top 20 largest, and 12 of the 20 most destructive have happened in the last decade. The U.S. wildfire season has gone from in the 1970s, 138 days, to today, 222 days. Over the last 10 years, we've had about 120 million trees either die or die in uh, here in California. And I'm going to give you some quick statistics and I'm going to move on. I want to tell you what we're going to do about it. But uh, we hear from some in the federal government that California doesn't have its act together uh, when it comes to forest management. And I'd like to give you some quick statistics uh, on forest land. 58% of forest land in California, 58% owned or managed by the federal government. Three. 3% owned or managed by the state or local government. So the U.S. Forest Service has seen their budget cut by $2 billion since 2016. 
This isn't a Republican or a Democrat problem. This is both parties that are cutting firefighting resources from the federal government. It started during the Obama era. Uh, and it's continuing. It's, it's escalating. So the state, though, we're going to invest about a billion dollars over the next five years in removing dead and dying trees and vegetation management, removing uh, high-risk vegetation around communities. Over the last 17 months, we've invested $100 million. Half of that has gone on to federal forest land. Half of it. So when we hear these partisan uh, arguments, just know, stop with the politics, y'all, and let's just focus on how to keep people safe, right? And that's what people want. And a fire is not going to discriminate if you are a Republican or a Democrat, uh, and nor should our federal or state governments. And that's where we need to be able to focus. So we're now making CAL FIRE a year-round firefighting agency. First time in our history, $40 million. We're making McClellan Air Attack Base, our largest air attack base in the state, where you have those really large planes that are doing the bombs. Uh, that's now year-round. We're going to get seven C-130, seven C-130 cargo planes. We're going to make them uh, the uh, air attack, War 8 bombers. They're going to come in and drop the flame retardant. We're, uh, we're getting rid of all of our Vietnam-era helicopters. That is the backbone of our helicopter firefighting fleet. We're now purchasing uh, a dozen Black Hawk helicopters. Two are now in state that will be put to work. And we're going to be able to fight fire at night because it's going to have, they're going to have night vision. We are now changing the way we fight fires. Rather than having the cavalry come in prior to the fire starting, we're now going to start compensating fire departments, and this happened last year, compensating fire departments to be able to stage during hot weather and high wind events called red flag events. So that we have boots on the ground, so when we have an incident breakout, they're there already to be able to combat that fire. I could go on, there's a lot more, but I want to just uh, finish here, talk about humble, if that's okay. I have been really frustrated in the past where I feel like we have not received the attention that we deserve, uh, and one-size-fits-all approaches simply don't work for our region. And it's been really important to me to be able to be active and engaged, and I'd like to talk to you about some of the items that we're focused on here in Humboldt and the North Coast. Number one, we've got to become a more active and engaged partner on rebuilding our infrastructure uh, in rural California. We're going to see record funding, whether it's for Arcata, Eureka, or Humboldt County, in road improvement dollars. Uh, millions more are coming in this year alone, tens of millions over the next decade. Number two, we're finally going to fix the last chance grade uh, that connects <coughs> Del Norte with Humboldt County. Uh, $50 million has been secured to be able to complete the environmental and engineering studies, to move it off the coast, go inland, so we don't keep having the slides that close and isolate uh, Del Norte County. Nursing. Uh, we are going to bring back the Bachelor's of Science nursing degree at Humboldt State University next year. Um, we, uh, we're in the midst of raising uh, five million dollars uh, in what we'll be announcing here in the coming months. We have additional donors above and beyond the two million that St. Joe's has now uh, picked in. So uh, we are dedicated to be able to get the fundraising done. We have to raise the five million um, here this year. We're dedicated to be able to getting that done and starting the nursing program. We need 75 nurses every year between Humboldt, Del Norte, Trinity, and Northern Mendocino counties, every year. And right now, if you want to get your bachelor's in nursing, you have to hightail it down to, hum to uh, Sonoma State, which is almost a four-hour drive. Completely unacceptable. Uh, and we are now also starting a feeder system into Humboldt State. Uh, at the same time that we're going to be launching the HSU uh, BSN program, Bachelor's of Science in Nursing, we're going to start uh, classes up in Crescent City, going from LVN, Licensed Vocational Nurse, to RN, and those registered nurses will then be able to feed in HSU. So get moving and uh, charged up. Um, look, again, $12 billion for affordable housing. We have another $3.5 million that's coming into Humboldt County to be able to uh, combat one of our biggest challenges, and that's homelessness. $2.5 million of loans coming in from the state, and one-time emergency funds for cities in the county if they want to be able to invest in a homeless shelter, showers, programs, drug and alcohol addiction uh, counseling, etc. That's here in the county now. And then, if we can just finally end up talking about opioid addiction. Um, look, Humboldt County has some of the highest numbers in the state when it comes to opioid addiction. And it is an incredibly controversial issue. I will share with you in 30 seconds my personal story. 
my brother-in-law, addicted to that, get emotional thing back, methamphetamine for a decade. And it rocked our family. It was awful. Uh, and he has turned himself around, in and out of, uh, of health centers and programs, day programs and uh, um, live-in programs, and just, it took a lot of time. And addiction is a health issue. We may differ on that opinion, but it's a health issue. And I am sick and tired of rural California not having the services that we need to be able to help the people that make our community strong. So we're about to open up uh, uh, an addiction health center in Eureka. It's going to have a hub and spoke model. It's with Aegis. Uh, it's going to be down on the waterfront. They just purchased the building. <coughs> Um, and we'll be able to see about an additional 500 patients each week. Um, and we're going to have patients coming in from throughout Humboldt, Trinity, and Del Norte counties. And we're going to ensure that Waterfront, Waterfront, who is a living facility, becomes Medi-Cal certified so that we can take in individuals without insurance as well. So that's really important for uh, myself, uh, and you're going to see significant progress in 2020. I invite you, if you can, to be able to join us today on our offshore wind hearing. Mr. President, I'm going way dang long. He's about to throw a chair at me. Um, so, uh, big proposal on the humble coast, as you all know. Uh, and we're going to be talking about how we can balance uh, the need for offshore wind, renewable resource, which is critical, and making sure that uh, fisheries are protected. And then um, I'll just end it here with the Great Redwood Trail. Um, so finally, we have a 300-mile rail line that y'all know about that goes from Humboldt Bay all the way down to San Francisco Bay. And right now, there is an agency that's running it that's functionally bankrupt. They're $12 million in debt. And it is a challenging uh, situation, to say the least. And there's been a lot of discussion that we need to be able to get freight into Humboldt County. I would say that would be ideal. We need it. And it's not going to happen. Just being honest about it. Um, and it's not going to be happen because over the last 20 years, folks have tried to be able to privately finance it, and it's just not a viable business venture. So where we're focused on is transitioning the 300-mile trail, uh, rail to trail. Uh, what we know is California has a $92 billion outdoor recreational economy. $92 billion. It's one of the highest growing economic sectors. Those who are out hiking and equestrian and biking are typically higher wealth individuals. Uh, and what we've seen is trails have transformed communities up and down this state when they've transitioned them from rails. And that is what our town hall tomorrow in Humboldt State is going to be all about, providing detail about the Great Redwood Trail, the economic benefits, and how we're going to be able to bring focus to the vision of this trail. Um, and it, I know it can be controversial, uh, but it is something that we're moving forward with. And we're also uh, happy to announce 32 million in different trail segments have been secured over the last six weeks uh, here in Humboldt and in Mendocino County. And we're going to see additional millions secured later this year. And I'll finally say we're not going to have offshore oil drilling off the California coast as the Bureau of Land Management is now pulling back. Uh, on their plan, uh, which was ludicrous already. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> questions, so questions coming from the I'm yeah, no, so on. Yes, sir. You know, as a forester that worked in Southern Humboldt County off and on over the years, you know, making the trails one thing, maintaining it's going to be, it just seems like, to me at the outset, I mean, there's really steep slopes, old real trees, massive landslides. You know, maintaining the rail was like a full-time job for a huge right. group. I mean, how do you maintain, how do you pay to maintain a remote trail? This isn't hand clippers and shovels. This is, I mean, it's just going to be a periodic expense that, it just seems like, you know, dollars per use hour, mile, whatever, it seems like, I don't know how they're going to make that work. It seems yeah. like a huge no, funding. It's a great question. Look, to be able to build a rail at uh, the, if, please push back if you think I'm wrong. It's, it's going to be about a million a mile. Um, and especially through the Eel River Canyon, it'll be even more, right? And candidly, I don't think we're ever going to be able to get the environmental certification to be able to get through the Eel River Canyon. Um, when we take a look at trail, if you're going between Willits and Fortuna, it's going to be probably between 10 and 20,000 a mile to be able to develop. So here's how we're going to do it. Number one, we know that we're going to be able to get one-time dollars to be able to build this thing. Then we need to be able to develop a budget for operations and maintenance. So here's what the, the next steps are. My belief is, don't do this fast, do it right. 
I do not want to get into a situation like we have right now with the NCRA where we're broke. So here's how we're focusing. This year, you're going to see three objectives. Number one, we got to wind down the NCRA. We're going to complete the audit by June 2020. 500,000 is secured to be able to do that. Number two, we have to do a boundary survey. We believe there are 1,900 property owners between Humboldt Bay and uh, uh, San Francisco Bay, but we have to complete the boundary survey. Number three, we have to do a trail assessment. So we have a million and a half dollars that's been secured to be able to uh, launch a trail assessment. Where is the trail going to go? and what type of surface throughout the, uh, the route. Four, next year we're going to launch um, the master plan. The master plan is going to be the roadmap for this system. How much is it going to cost to construct? What's the ongoing operation and maintenance? And developing a funding plan to be able to uh, fund ongoing dollars. So I would be up here BSing you right now if I were to tell you here's the final price tag to construct and here's how we're going to do it. We need a plan. And what I will promise you this, you're going to see a detailed plan about how we're going to be able to, one, construct and maintain uh, within the next 36 to 48 months. Yeah. Do you know what the widest access points are on that trail? Like, what's the widest trail between where you can get at it? Do you have an idea? Because there's some really remote sections. Super remote Island sections. mountains, six-mile oh. tunnels you got to go around. No, you're absolutely right. And so um, that's what this trail assessment is going to do. I mean, we're literally going to be flying that trail, hiking that trail, uh, starting here this summer to be able to do exactly what you're talking about. And if you'd allow me to come back next year, I'd love to be able to answer your question and bring your presentation if you'd be willing. Um, I'd love to be able to come back with more information on that. Please, sir. Um, what's the status of the universal health care movement in California? So the, so the universal health care movement, uh, I'll be honest about it, and I'll tell you my point of view. I think that we need to be able to go to a single-payer system. We have uh, lower GDP countries uh, that, um, that are able to do it, and California can afford it, um, but we have to be able to do a, a plan. And what is the reason why uh, universal single-payer systems have failed in the past is because the state has not developed a financial plan and the data plan to be able to complete it. So here's where we're at. If a single-payer bill were to be advanced this year, it would fail in the legislature. That's my belief. Uh, so, the governor has proposed a plan to create a 14-member Healthy California Commission. That commission would be focused on developing a financial plan and data plan to be able to implement. I believe that it would take three, maybe five years to be able to uh, develop the plan to be able to implement in California. When I say the plan, there's a few challenges that we have to focus on. Number one, we have to get waivers from the federal government for Medicaid and Medicare. Federal government is not in the business of providing any favors to the state of California at this point. That is going to be the bulk of the dough that would pay for a single payer system. Number one. Number two, we have to be able to talk about some logistical issues. Will the state of California care for veterans? Right now, veterans are through the VA system. We have to figure that out. We have to figure out how we're going to get Medicare information into an antiquated system uh, for our health care records. We need to be able to get a new healthcare record system up. I say all this, that's what this commission is going to be doing, is going through, there's about 15 different subject areas, super complicated, that they're going to be working on, uh, and that's what I'm hoping that we're going to be able to see this year. Um, so it's not moving as of now, but creating the commission that would be able to bring forward the business plan as well as the plan for patients. Does that answer the question? Yes, it does. Thank you. Thank you so much. Please. Great. Uh, so you made an excellent point, and, and healthcare discussions really focus on, on people, which is important. A another point that, that is, is important for us in economic development in, in rural areas is that it stabilizes the hospital system as well. And I was on the St. Joseph's Foundation Board for many years, and we went from when I started there with a hospital that was in a huge deficit, borrowing money from other hospitals in the system, and cutting to uh, post Affordable Care Act, because the way our patient mix is, is, is horrible here, I mean, in terms of payers, to now a hospital that can do things like invest $2 million into the nursing program. And Which so, you're you know, Trinity Hospital, St. Joseph's System, you know, Southern Humboldt, it, it, it's made an incredible difference uh, on stabilizing the health provider side of, of, of the house. And so that sometimes gets lost when we talk about universal care and all that, but, you know, without it, we may not have these hospitals. And um, 
And so the whole question becomes moot at that point. You bring a beautiful point up, and there is an absolute business case to be made, whether it's hospitals or health centers. Let's, let's be honest. We've expanded the number of individuals who have insurance, which means we've expanded the number of individuals who are payers who are able to assist those institutions. And I got to tell you, rural California is in real trouble if the ACA goes away. Just want to say thank you. I am feeling the hook. <laughs> Thank you so much. We made a donation in your name to the Wheelchair Foundation, and you can choose which one you want. <laughs> we either made you just you or Senator. Oh, no, this is great. Senator. <laughs> thank you. This means a lot to me. Thank awesome. you very much. Thank you for being here. Thank you very much.
Actually, how, there's how, many do huh? how do you go about getting projects? How do you go about getting projects? Well, this project actually came when we announced we needed projects, and Lori Breyer happened to know about this um, current project. So we're hoping to get a grant and maybe even involve a water catchment system if it's feasible, um, and add a little shed because currently all their tools are in their greenhouse, so they can't use that. But um, yeah, just bring it up, email us. Join the committee. Thank you, Rachel. Raffle. I know there's tickets out there, and I know there's a. How much is it? What are we at? Twenty dollars. It's a twenty. Two, one. Hey! 